we are carrying on. A uh, little bit of logistic update. In a week, there's the midterm. Everyone knows we talked about it last week. And on Tuesday, Ferris is going to do a review session. So we'll release a practice midterm, and Ferris is going to go over in class on Tuesday, and then you have the midterm on Thursday. Yes? When will, will the practice midterm be released before Tuesday, so we can work on it before the review session, or will it be released on thinking? Tuesday? Well, I was going to let you decide. <laughs> that way you can have their wrath, depending on your answer. That's an outside. Okay, we'll, we'll decide and announce it. Any other questions? Yeah. Everything that we're covering? Up till today. End of today. The beginning of the semester, our very first day together. Yeah. Can we expect the uh, review exam to be similar to the real one, or is there no guarantee of that? Uh, I'm not going to. Uh, similar in what aspect? I mean, it'll be in English. Like Topics that. covered. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would not say that's a guarantee. So okay. the, anything that we've talked about from the beginning, so you guys got to think like me. What's the point of having midterms? To make you suffer? Yes. 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 Yeah. To, What's test the if, to test if you know or follow along. To, uh, not even less of knowing if you follow along. To me, it's more about have you, like, do you understand the content in the course that we've covered, right? That's the whole point, we meet here every week, you're paying for class. Like the whole point is to understand the content, right? Ideally, I could just pick your brain and point a little laser and figure out that, yeah, you know everything in the course, you're good to go. But I can't realistically, if you think about as a set of all topics that we've covered, I can't realistically in an hour and 15 minutes test you in depth on every single topic, right? So I have to limit in some sense what I test on but if I tell you what I'm going to test on, then you'll only study those things and there'll be huge holes in your knowledge. So the goal is, I don't tell you what I'm going to test on so that you study everything. You will come super prepared, ready for any questions, and then I will test on certain things, and that's how it's going to go. All right, cool. All right, so on to authentication. So somebody remind us, what is authentication? When did we talk about it before? Access control lists. Access control lists in what sense? So what does it mean? So what does authentication mean? Are you who you say you are? Are you who you say you are? And how does that differentiate with the other A concept? Which is related to access control, yeah. The authorization, which is means what you have to. Yeah, so authorization is authentication says who are you? Authentication. Uh, yeah. Authentication says who are you, and authorization says what are you allowed to do on the system. So, is authentication important? Yeah. yeah. Can you authorize people if you don't know who they are? Yeah. Then what's the point, right? Because you're ultimately just uh, making stuff up, or if you just trust that they are who they say they are. Yeah, I'm an administrator on this system then uh, you may not as well have any authorization rules in the first place. <coughs> cool. And there's a little bit of, you know, so clearly access control and authentication are really linked. Um, I like to talk about it after we talk about crypto because a lot of the concepts of how you do authentication rely on crypto concepts, which is why we're talking about it now. Cool. There you go, boom. You all just did that. Okay, so. <coughs> We're going to define some terms to talk about. So when we talk about authentication, what are the what are the important parts? So that we have the high level goal of who are you, but what's actually important? Clarification. Clarification in what sense? Do you mean for me? Ease of use. Why is that important? I don't want to have to provide three 
forms of documentation just to log into my computer every morning. Let's think about it in this way. In terms of identity, what actually are we talking about? Does a system, like, when you authenticate to a, let's say, a computer system, what are you actually proving or demonstrating? Yeah. You're just showing that you know the code to get in. Possibly. I mean, maybe, but is it... Uh, I've forgotten all your names. Sorry. Uh, I'll use Ferris. I know him. Um, when Ferris logs onto a website, do they say, ah, you're Ferris. You're from Turkey. You are a PhD student at ASU. Do they know his identity, like his physical? <coughs> Maybe, but not necessarily. Maybe, but not necessarily. Why? Because they only know the data that's tied to his identity. Right. It's like relevant to that site. To that specific system, exactly, right? So when we talk about identity and identifying and asking the question, who are you? It's not in terms of a philosophical or like a personal who you are, but who are you in terms of the system, right? And so why, I mean, and why is that important to understand? It's what you're authorized to do on that system. Right, because, and that's why they're tied together, right? Your identity on the system defines what you can do in terms of uh, authorization. And so authenticating to the system is all about on the system terms. They don't care if, you know, whatever. They don't care about your background. They just want to say who you are in some sense that the system actually cares about. So, all right. Um, so we'll go over these at kind of a high level, but the basic idea is, and I guess another question to, we'll pull this back a little bit. So you, like, a principal we'll call is like the unique entity. So I, like, I'm a principal, you're all principals in terms of authentication. Do each of us have a unique identity on every system? Hopefully. Hopefully. Why? Do we need a unique identification on every system? Oh, no. Why? Like, if you're just logging on, or if you just like go on a mini clip to play some video games, you don't care that your scores are saved. You don't, you don't need to, like, they don't need to know who you are or care what you played. Right. So in that sense, so maybe, maybe there's no concept of authentication because we don't even care about authorization at all. Uh, what else? It's Every system you ever used has a unique. Every person or and principal has a unique. Shared accounts. Shared accounts? Oh, you guys never use shared accounts? Sure. Never. Never. <laughs> Nobody wants to admit it. Okay, cool. Uh, so everyone <laughs> definitely has their own Netflix accounts. Uh, and, but even more so, if you think about systems, and we talked about role-based access control. Maybe for certain systems, that admins uh, share the same password. So if you think about the root password, every admin maybe shares that password. And then, so they're all different principles, but they all have a, un a different or the same identity on the system. So when we talk about identity, uh, we're going to talk about that in the system. And uh, the subject, this just kind of helps us think about it in abstract terms. Something that acts on behalf of an entity. So what? Um, so on your computer system, what things act on behalf of you? Autocorrect. Auto autocorrect. Okay, yes, that's good. What else? System processes. Yeah, system process acts on behalf of you, your user, to do something. Uh, and then authentication really just binds an identity to a subject. So <laughs> saying that um, this subject can act on behalf of this identity. So. I think I've alluded to this before, but now we're going to have an in-depth discussion. How do you, and this actually ties in very well with your homework assignment, how do you know people are who they say they are? Right, yeah, this is the core problem. DNA sequencing. How do you actually do that, though? <laughs> Can you tell who I am just from my DNA? Oh, I, I could. It's not practical at all. But how could you? So let's say I gave you a sample of my DNA. Do you know that that's my DNA? How do you know that I didn't I steal it somebody myself. else's? If you collect it yourself, what if I pump somebody else's blood in me and that's the sample that you How do you know that's me? 
Yeah. Usually direct interface, like in a direct exchange with the person, or you go through a trusted third party. So a direct exchange with the person? So define that <coughs> more precisely. Like in the, are you talking about in the real world? Yeah, so like, I watch you pump your blood and give it to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you just know it came from my body. You don't know that it actually was my blood. Yeah. I'm just going to blindly trust you. You're going to blindly trust me. Thank you. I'll, I'll see you later. <laughs> if you repeatedly show up and provide a DNA sample every single day, we can, be, we can at the end of every single day, the trust we have in you and the fact that it's your DNA. Okay, so maybe right. you have some test and the trust in me over time. You've seen the movie Gattaca. <laughs> this is the exact concept here. This is why I'm taking the opposite approach. Yeah, in the front. Uh, <coughs> wait, wait, in the front first? No. no. Uh, you could have uh, like some sort of like government like database to like match with. Mm -hmm. so, like, well, are these guys? If these guys say they're good, then we can say that they're good. A good in what sense? We're not talking about good. We're talking about who they uh, are. Good as in like if they're authentic. Like uh, I don't know. What my tongue said. <laughs> yeah. there. I mean, there's always going to be some percent chance that you don't know who that someone is who they say they are even right. in like you know <laughs> obviously with digital transactions or with someone that you've never met that's pretty high but even in person like mm -hmm. there it's not impossible for like I don't know someone to replace Jason and like got plastic surgery to look like him and like fall so, break is a perfect opportunity for that. yeah <laughs> so up. you know there's things like oh we're gonna meet in person and exchange our keys is like pretty good and it definitely decreases your like margin of mistrust but i would say don't resort to uh plastic surgery to win the web of trust assignment <laughs> i would advise against but you never know <laughs> okay so break it down though so how so okay so one thing you said is dna right what are other ways you could identify me and how do you actually but so what I was trying to get at, if you just pluck a piece of my DNA, does my DNA actually say this is Adam Dupay? Adam Dupay? No, what does it say? It says this is the DNA that I plucked from your body. On this date, at this time, in this place, yeah. right? And then how do you then later <laughs> authenticate me that I was that same person that you took that DNA from? More DNA. <laughs> You have to take more DNA and then compare it with a database of what you've already known to see that it's me. What other aspects has this come up of that doesn't involve taking something from me? A password. Thank you. A password? Yes. So in what sense? Say that again. So elaborate. Uh, I mean, it's kind of the same idea. And like we all do it whenever we create accounts. Like you say, hey, I'm me. Here's my username. Here's my password. That's like the initial DNA sample. Mm -hmm. And then every time you go to log on after, you provide another sample, which would be the password. All right, good. Uh, we'll circle back to this in a second. Yeah, what are some other ways? Uh, if I knew Ferris before this class, and I trusted Ferris, you know, I could turn to him and go, like, is that really Adam Dupay mm -hmm. standing up there? Is it just a random guy? I see. So you could use, uh, like, the web of trust kind of thing and ask people you trust to see if they trust me. Well, what else? How do you get into your cell phones? Password. Face ID. Say pin. pin. Fingerprint. So is a fingerprint like a fingerprint are non-unique, <laughs> or with current databases, right? So fingerprints. What else? Which is face. Is face recognition. What's the difference between face recognition, fingerprints, <coughs> DNA, and a password on a <coughs> You can change the password, but you cannot change those files. So you can change a password. Has anybody changed a password before? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Have you changed your DNA recently? Uh, yeah. yeah, in the back. So a password is something you know. Those other things are something that you are. Yeah, so a password would be something that you know. So some kind of, you talk to somebody, you either give them a secret phrase, they give you a secret phrase, and <coughs> later you could verify that they're the same person because they tell you that, yeah. The first two are actually like reliably verifiable, while the second two aren't. Mm. Um, In which, can you define which two? I've lost Yeah, count. so like fingerprints with the systems we have aren't unique. There was like a case where a guy got accused of bombing a train in Spain because his fingerprint happened to match. And he was like, I've been in, I think it was like New Hampshire for like mm. the last five years or something. 
and their fingerprints were a perfect match in the system <laughs> because of how that works. And then, like, everyone reads the articles about how much face recognition screws up. Like, yeah. that's not perfect. So the first time they came out with that, all you needed, like, especially in the computers, uh, the face recognition, all you needed was a picture of a person. And then they did something and they tried to do liveness detection to see if somebody was alive or a piece of paper. And specifically what they looked for is if the eyes moved. So then what they did is they made a piece of paper, cut out the eyes, and made little <laughs> slits for their eyes to move, and then it would log them into the system. Um, so for all these methods, so we can think about them in different ways, about what are their kind of innate characteristics, but also how useful are they for authenticating or uh, uh, authenticating a person. What's the level of, so, so uh, a false positive in this case, well, a false negative would be a system um, saying that you're not who you say they are when you actually are. So denying you access when it is. So that would be if you've ever <coughs> had old iPhones, I think. Uh, if your fingers were sweaty, the fingerprint reader would not be very good and not let you in. Um, other way would be a false positive would be if they let you in when you're not on the system. So that would be all of you. If you were able, if somebody in here had the same thumbprint as me and was able to log into my phone. I don't know what the odds of that are. But fundamentally, so when we think about authentication mechanisms, um, we want to separate them into kind of different categories, at least at a high level. And this goes back to, so a password is something that you know. So it's a unique piece of information that is something that you know. Your DNA, your fingerprints, uh, anybody ever, I've actually never had it done, but the retinal scans. Those are actually real things where they can scan the inside of your retina and uh, use that as an authentication mechanism. Hand geometry. What was it? Hand geometry as well. Geometry like of your eye? No, 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 the eye. Like you put your hand into a, like a mm. scanner and you get hand geometry. Oh, interesting. So they can do some kind of hand print in some sense? Voice yeah. recognition. Voice recognition systems? What's like the most common voice recognition systems? <coughs> Yeah, you have them in your homes on your phones, right? Siri, hey Google, all that stuff. It's supposed to not work, I mean, it's supposed to be trained on your voice so other people can't use it. Um, that does not work very well, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, so these are all things that you are. And so the key difference here is you can't change something that you are. I mean, ideally, right? Beyond what we talked about of crazy measures to actually change all of these features that the only way that you've ever identified or authorized people by a secret password or testing their DNA? An ID? So an ID, what's, why is an ID useful? Yeah, so that you're verifying that, so if I showed you my ID, that would mean that, what would that mean? So I show you my ID. What would I do? So you'd match the picture with me, the person in person, and you'd probably match the name with what you think my name is. Does that mean I'm definitely who I say I am? Yeah. It also depends on like what ID you're showing us for. Like if you walked in here <coughs> and you just pulled out your driver's license and said I'm Adam Dupay, that doesn't matter because it's your driver's license, not your ASU ID. Mm. So you know you're still here to teach a class, not to you know drive us around. <laughs> yes, very true. Uh, so yeah, so then maybe the context is important there, what IDs you're willing to trust. Um, is anybody from a state that doesn't have the whatever national ID requirements or something? No, there's some states where their ID systems don't match federal requirements, so if you're going to TSA or going to a government agency, you need to have your passport to authenticate to them because they don't trust your state-issued ID license. Um, so think about another way. So one way to authenticate somebody when you meet in person would be, like we talked about on the web, some kind of password, uh, which would be some kind of knowledge. But what if I gave you a unique, let's say an object? <coughs> and then that way, every time you saw me, you say, hey, I'm Adam, and here's my object. I would say, oh yeah, that's the thing that I gave you earlier. Uh, the analogy is a little weird. Another thing would be, um, if your cell phone, if I could somehow uniquely identify your cell phone, and I could say, oh yeah, that's your cell phone. Um, so 
these are kind of the um, three main categories we think about. Uh, what do you know? So what's some information that you know that supposedly nobody else knows? What you possess? So this would be something like, uh, anybody use, that's uh, no, right, students don't have to use it yet. Two-factor authentication for ASU? Any employees? Yeah, some of you. So you have to, and what's that verifying? That second factor, yeah. That you own the device associated with that two-factor authentication. Right, so that you have the device that is used in that, in that authentication mechanism. So do you, does that mean you don't have to provide a password? No, but if somebody steals your password or guesses it, they don't possess your phone, and so they shouldn't be able to access your systems. Cool. And so the third category is what you are. Right? So that's biometrics, those kind of things that should be very difficult to change. Any other examples of these three that we didn't talk about? Face ID? Um, face ID, which of these would be face ID? Like, kind of like biometric, I guess. Yeah, so it would be what you are. Yeah. Who would you put uh, challenge questions, like first pet's name, mm. mother's maiden name, what you know? Yeah, I think I would, well, I think I would agree. There was a lot of uh, what you knows. I, it kind of, maybe it does depend. Um, it depends, I guess, if you were the one to originate the answer to that question and then later on gave it back. So I think in that case, it is a what you know. Um, anybody done like a credit report or anything and get authenticated that way? What do they do? Anybody, yeah. They ask you what car you own, where you live, mm -hmm. things of public record. They are yeah. things that you know, but they are also what you are from a historical perspective. Right, exactly. That's why in that sense, I'd say it's a little bit trickier to <coughs> precisely categorize that because you can't go back and change those things. But they are, it should be something that you know, but you can't change your past addresses. That's like the hardest one. I always have to go to Amazon and look at where I've shipped things to see if I've lived in these places. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we're back. Yeah, so like, would a driver's license fit into what you possess? Because it's technically yours, but the government issues it to you. So you're kind of authenticating via the government. What do you all think? Yeah. It's what you possess, because it's like the government is giving you this object, and then, and then you can give that to somebody else, and they should be able to verify that you are that. Yeah, I'd probably put that over there. Yeah. Um, so back to the like credit card thing that you were mm -hmm. giving an example of. So, wouldn't that be like what you know? Because like someone else could like theoretically just use that same information. Because like what you are kind of needs to be like something that only you could provide, sort of thing. Yeah, it's very tricky. It's more like a. But the other key difference between the two is change of like can you change that thing? And you can't change what addresses you've lived at in the past, right? Those are right. a fixed quantity. It's more like almost it's testing what you were. That's when we can add. Yeah, maybe there you go. Let's write a paper on it. Yeah. What other people know about you? What other people know about you? In what sense? So, going back to the earlier thing, mm -hmm. kind of also the government, but also like other people around. If I really trust Ferris, mm. I can go back to him and say, you know, is that this person? Is that true? Is that true? Right. So then you could get other people to vouch for you. So you could. Um, yeah, so I think this happened to me in the brickyard at least once where I got locked. I didn't have my ASU ID card, so I couldn't get into the building after hours. But I'm like, I'm a professor here. I have an office. And so they escorted me up to my office. And I was like, look, my name, my, like, I am, this is my office. So, uh, yeah, they let me in because of that. And that was kind of more of a using different objects to try to demonstrate who you are. Yeah. Um, kind of on that topic. So like my friend went into the army or something like mm -hmm. that and they did like a huge background check and so mm. some guy like contacted me. I had no idea yeah. who he was, but he was like, do you know this guy? Like what has he done? Like who is he? So um, that's kind of like um, what, yeah. who, like what other people know. Right, about the person. And they're matching that with what they've told them to see yeah. if, it's, if it's the same thing. Yeah, I've done a number of uh, background checks for students getting clearances. Yeah. So uh, well, I have like that. So they, they input that number, 
send it to your account and then that will unlock your account right now. Mm, interesting. Uh, so that would maybe be, yeah, I think that would be like a web of trust style of what other people know it's you. It's also a weird one, Facebook used to do this where if it saw a suspicious login, it would show you pictures and say which ones are your friends, like match them up to the friends. Uh, presumably because you would be able to do that, but a random person wouldn't be able to. Um, yeah. What other things? Anybody ever mark uh, street signs in a picture? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's that for? Not robot. Mode. Not robot? Yeah, so you're authenticating yourself as a human in some sense? Uh, like you're processing just for Google, just like verifying You, they have turned the question of are you a robot or not into a way to help them yeah. do robot and stuff better. But yes, fundamentally, if you fail that, they'll say you're an automated system <coughs> go away. So there actually are authorizing, uh, authenticating you in the sense of human or not. Yeah. What? Why can't robots do that? Like we have robots that can recognize street signs. It's yeah, isn't Google's thing to feed the purpose? If it's learning how to recognize things. There was definitely a paper that used Google's own image recognition software to break their own capital <laughs> systems. <laughs> Uh, it's more about the effort level, I think, in terms of making it more difficult for people to do that. I mean, we'll talk about CAPTCHAs later, so that's like a whole subject okay. of are yeah, they effective like or not. Ten lines of TensorFlow. Yeah. Yes. Like so, solver yeah, for sure. There's CAPTCHA solver, solver services, which um, do you know? So everyone's familiar with the CAPTCHA. That's the thing that says, are you an automated person or not? Um, so there's... How do you solve that? So you're a bad guy who wants to bypass this for whatever reason. What are your options? Write a program to solve it. I mean, write a program to solve it? So you could write some complex AI that solves or the system or uses some deep learning? Yeah. There's also the cap chats where you literally just check a box that says you're not a robot. So yeah. yes. I don't know the software in place behind that, like what prevents other softwares from just checking that box. So it's I running complicated checks of your browser environment to see if you're a real browser or a headless selenium or just an automated script or whatever. So it does some stuff, but not to say that that couldn't be bypassed. What's your other option? So you could write a program to do it. Yeah. You could pay someone to sign up. You could pay someone to do it, right? You can pay, and this is how, uh, actually a lot of the capture breaking services do. They just farm it out to people who will do it for pennies or uh, the other way is, let's say you go to a site that has content that you really want to see, um, whatever else, say it's streaming some video of something that's uh, not available in your area, and they would just pop up CAPTCHAs to make sure that you're a human, but you don't know that that's actually a CAPTCHA for somebody else trying to break or automate some system. So basically farming it out to other people as CAPTCHAs and then putting the results back into the automated system. Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, ways that you can break that. Cool, okay, so, oh, another one we didn't talk about is uh, where you are, so what, what would that be? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so if I, like, check my uh, credit card history and mm -hmm. see, you know, there's an awful lot of charges for gas up in Oregon and I've never been to Oregon, that would kind of be a flag. Right? Or you didn't have any flights purchased to Oregon and there was no rental car purchase in Oregon, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they can try to infer your location based on that? Yeah, do you have a, yeah. Say, uh, <coughs> a Right. Are you trying to log in from Greece or Eastern Europe? Yeah, this happens all the time, right? The, the um, when you're accessing a system, they say, hey, or if you're traveling and you try to access Gmail, it's like, ah, it's a little sketchy. Like, this is somebody now in a completely different location. Yeah. Access to like a work network if you when you're like out of, out of the workplace. Yeah, a work network. So, or, I mean, that would be maybe when are you as well? They could say, are you accessing this at 3 a.m. your time? That's a little weird. Maybe we'll do that. Yeah. Um, you like the IP address where you can log into Yeah, exactly. So there's a lot of, a lot of companies will restrict IP access to make sure that only certain IP ranges can access certain things. Yeah, yeah. MAC addresses too, so if mm. you log into a different computer, it's a lot of times it will require you to update the case, like email or something. Yeah.
Yeah, so this is uh, actually the main way that like public Wi-Fi's that require registration are uh, authenticating you with your MAC address. So if you, and you know you can change your MAC address. Yep. So like if you want internet on your phone and your computer, if you change their MAC address to one that you've already paid for, then you'll have internet on both, but you can't have it at the same time, otherwise that would cause mass havoc. Um, but you can definitely do that. Cool, all right. <coughs> So when we think about, so again, we're going to think about these things, uh, an authentication system conceptually, so that we can then uh, dig in and be able to discuss what types of, uh, what we mean by an authentication system. So, uh, so we'll call A some kind of information that proves identity. So what were some examples of information that proves identity in what we've talked about so far? ID. Passwords, I, government ID, retinal scan, retinal scan. Knowledge, of your past. knowledge of your past, yeah, all these kinds of things. Um. <laughs> objects. Objects, yeah, so objects that we have and show. Uh, we'll call C because, um, and this actually makes sense when we think about, so think about what we talked about with the retinal scan. Can an authentication system give you a yes, you're authorized, uh, can, sorry, authorized. Uh, can a retinal scan authenticate you just on your retina alone? The scan of your retina? No. What, is, what else does it need? It needs to match it with something else, right? It needs to have some complementary data that it's collected in the past of who you are. Maybe it gets that from a government system. Maybe it uh, adds you to that information the first time that it sees you, whatever. So there's some We'll call it C, some like complementary information that's used to identify who you are. So <coughs> F will be a function that maps the information you give to the complementary information. So for a retinal scan, this would be the database lookup of looking up this complementary information in the database based on the retinal scan. L will actually do the authentication function, so you need some function to actually give you a yes or no, is this person authorized? What should the type of this function be, based on the types we've already discussed? <laughs> yeah. Uh, hash. A hash, last two low level, this is a high level. Uh, an authentication system that can model both password-based hashing and retina scans and all the other things. I was going to say it should be like a one-to-one -one function. A one-to-one -one function that maps, well, uh, yeah, anyways, uh, that's probably more of what I would do, but um, we'll say right now if, well, I guess we don't have any information in here about what who you're trying to authenticate. We'll say that A kind of has that claim in there. So we're, we'll say like true or false, yeah. Um. Do you know, this is kind of a question, for like- It's kind of a question or is it a question? It is a question. Okay. It's not super like related, but for biometric <coughs> authentication mm -hmm. systems, is that all of that data is still hashed to be compared or is it stored raw? <coughs> Usually, I wouldn't call it hashed. Um, like you can't just get on their database and get raw retinal data from everyone in their system, can you? Well, if you're in their system and you wanted that, I would wait and get all of the authentication scans and store them all of everyone who's authenticating to the system. Um, you, right, it's not, I wouldn't call it a hash. I, w I would definitely wouldn't call it a cryptographic hash because I don't know that it's completely irreversible and has all the properties we want from a cryptographic hash. But yeah, I call it more of a fingerprint where they take the retinal scan, they'll do some, they'll figure out what important points there are using some algorithm and store that information. And then when a new one comes in, they do the same transformation and compare yeah. the features is, against each other. Is there a reason they don't do like cryptographic hash for it? Uh, because of the noise. So the cryptographic hash, if you have a one bit difference in input, you should have a completely different hash. So okay. that's the key problem, yeah. Could you elaborate on the F function? Yes. So the F function simply just maps the information we give it to any complementary information that they, uh, so given, let's say a retinal scan, it would return the, let's say C in this case is the, um, the features that are stored about that specific user, that's, or that identity that's trying to log in. And then 
model would then look and say, okay, this user with this retinal scan is has this stored fingerprint. Do these match? Yes or no? Makes sense. Any other questions? And so basically then you need some functions to be able to add information to see or alter information. Uh, what, what are some cases where you would want to remove information or alter information? Yeah. So you might want to alter like your password if it's been compromised. Yeah, alter your password, right? So change your password. So you want the identity once they've authenticated to the system to be able to then change that password that's stored. What else? Now, when somebody leaves, you may want to delete their account completely. Yeah. <coughs> Just so the difference between A and C is that A is really only captured once. And that you A is the information provided by the user that wants to authenticate. So you can think of the identity that they're trying to authenticate as, as long, along with any other information that they have to try to prove they are who they say they are. So in this, in the case of a username and password, A would be the username and password. C might be, um, if we're talking about a stored uh, salted hash database, that would be the database of all passwords. And then F would map what user they're trying to get with the salted hash word, and then L would compare those two and say true or false, yes, the authentication, uh, this person is who they say they are. And then S would be the ability to add your password, update your password. I mean, S is just a set of functions that would basically take in an A and return taking an A along with some whatever information you need and return either a new A or C. Yeah. So if I'm trying to authenticate as a user that doesn't exist or with bad information, how does F map A to C? Because the result would not be in C. It would. Uh, you could hand wave that away by saying that it's C includes the empty set. And then that way if you turn the empty set, you would say, OK, nothing. Uh, no information stored in here. Or it could be maybe there's a guest user in C that it would return, and then that way L would use that to check, hey, guest user, go away. Because maybe you are allowing guest users in your system, right? Uh, so this captures that behavior as well. <laughs> Any other questions? Again, just like um, when we looked at crypto systems, this just gives us a high level way to think about, okay, that's like you. Given an authentication system, you can say, okay, what are the different components here? How do they work in, in this overall terms of an authentication system? So how would a <coughs> password-based system be represented by this? So let's switch to handwriting mode. Ah. Okay, I've got to pause this. Do I have a pot way to pause it? Okay, for a super simple password system, what would it look like here? Why can't I make this smaller? Okay, all right. Magic. Works. Okay, so we want a password system. So somebody described to me at a high level what a password system does. They give you a password, and then you compare it with some stored version of that password. And then if they're the same, then they're the user. And if they're not the same, then they're not the user. Yeah. So what else do they give you in addition to the password? Uh, a username. Right, yeah, so a username. So, um, so the authentication information, so how would you describe that set? Uh, username and password. Yeah, so a tuple of username passwords, I would say, of strings. Um, we'll just call them username. Uh, as much as I love writing, I'm going to say uname and pass. Uh, where <coughs> uname and pass are all, we'll say, all possible string combinations for now. 
So then what's C? Also, uh, you name and pass. Yeah, so right now we'll just keep it simple. We'll say it's the same. It's actually the same set as A. So we'll just store all the usernames and passwords in our database. And then F becomes really simple. I mean, would, we're not going to write it out, but take the username in from A, look it up in C, and return that password. Right? Because F is only mapping. Um, F takes in an A and a C, and you could easily write um, a function that basically, I'll use it like a terrible hash table. Uh, a. This is the great thing about not actually coding. You can do whatever you want since I haven't defined anything. So look up in C based on the username, whatever A's username is. Return that tuple. So then how do we actually authenticate this? So we're given, we'll call it, uh, yeah, we'll call it A and little c. So how do we, what's our authentication function? If the passwords are the same? Yeah, so, well, is that, so let's do a dot pass. C dot pass. And the usernames are the same. Yeah, so I may, I may need to, I think this guarantees that the usernames are the same, the C function, uh, but I don't think there's quite a lot of harm in doing that. Um, Anything else? We're good? Cool. And then what kind of S functions would we want? Changing the password. <coughs> Change password. So it takes in a C and a username and password, and that would update, find the user in there, update the <coughs> password, return a new C <coughs> with that new, um, yeah. When um, people change their passwords, is it, uh, best practice to generate a new salt for that password, or does it not matter at all? Uh, we have not talked about salts or hashing at all. So what is this? So if you were implementing this, what's stored in your complementary information C? All the username and password for all users. Yeah. So for right now, we would not do any of that. We would just change it. Yeah. Uh, Which one? At the very top? No, the L function. Uh, the L and. What does S? Well, what should it be? So if I just give you the correct username, should it let me in? No. Correct. Yeah. yeah. What's S say? Is that just uh, S, so this would be a change. So this is like what kind of functions do we want? We want something to change passwords. What else do we want? Delete. Delete. Uh, maybe reset. What else? Add. Add, yeah. So very important, right? We start out with empty uh, complementary data. We need to add a new user to the system or a new um, authentication information to the system. And you could write these very similar to kind of how we did here in English of doing stuff, yeah. Just write, uh, can we just follow mm -hmm. the Can I? That's a good question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this Username and password are what? Hmm? The username and password are what? A, a tuple, uh, this was, I'm kind of abusing notation, so <coughs> the set A is a set of tuples where the first <laughs> element is username, we're going to call username, the second one is password, such that username and password are all possible strings. So you can think of, so A is a set containing tuples, the first element of the tuple is all be any possible string, the second element of the tuple is any possible string. <coughs> if we had requirements on usernames or whatever, we could define them kind of in here. Right? Any other questions? So we just developed a super simple password-based authentication system. We'll see another way of doing that where we didn't. Uh... So yeah, so basically this will be if we're just storing passwords. Uh, without the user information, but I think it makes more sense to think about the user information. Uh, cool. Okay, so what's the problem with this authentication <coughs> system? We have all these usernames and passwords stored together. On yeah, but the it's system. my site. 
I own this site. Someone and these are my to. users. Except are you allowing friend. other people on your site? Sure. I mean, it's a site. There's accounts. People can sign up for accounts. But it's my site, right? I know their user. I mean, they're my users. Shouldn't I know their usernames and passwords? Some people use like the same password. That's their problem. <laughs> Convince me otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, if they are storing sensitive data on that site, maybe you shouldn't be allowed to see those usernames. If they're storing sensitive data on that site, but this I own the site, I also own all the data that they're uploading. So why can't I see the passwords? Yeah. You should be able to, but if somebody pretends to be you, it's like a single point of failure. So <coughs> if somebody pretends to be me, then what could they do? You get everyone's information, but I guess technically it belongs to you, but now it belongs to them. Right. So if anyone breaks into my system, they get the list of all the usernames and passwords in my system. Right with this C. Or if they trick my application to somehow divulge C, now everyone knows everyone's username and passwords, and then what can that person do? Essentially anything. Say that again? Essentially anything they want on the system. As any user, right? They can authenticate to the system as any user because they now know all of the passwords. I don't know, should I really care about that? I feel like that's your problem. I build really safe software. <laughs> Wouldn't your information and credentials also be stored in C? Oh, I don't use the system. I just build it. <laughs> well, ultimately, you're running the site probably to make money. And if you were to have a information leak, it would not be good for business. Ooh. Is that a true statement? Depending on your business, some businesses make more money when they have security leaks. Uh, yes, there was. What's the? I remember the name of the company. Oh, I think it's Equifax. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's now back to exactly where it was before the breach was announced. It had a dip of like 40 or 50 percent, and now maybe even better. Yeah, yeah they, I don't they know. They bought a bunch of identity theft companies and turned around and sold to all of the users that they exploited. Or, well, I wouldn't say they exploited them, but. Well, no, but. They're users that were exploited. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah okay, so. I don't know, what do you think? Is this, is this a problem or isn't it a problem? Right, at the end of the day, you're, you may be a developer that's implementing an authentication system. Yeah, so I may, so maybe, so I'm <coughs> trying to talk about me as the organization, but an organization doesn't actually exist. It's composed of different people, right? So you may have the database administrator who has access to, to maybe some of this database. You may have the developers that have access to some things, but they don't just have the ability to go log in as any user, but if they can see all these passwords, you have to trust that no employee is ever gonna use this information to log in as a user. You also have a trust that if C is ever released to the public, your database of username and passwords, um, if you know about it, is that, I mean, that's good because you can use your reset password functionality to forcefully change everybody's password. If you don't know about it, what happens? You, someone else could use the, the leaked passwords to log in. Yeah, as your users, right? Potentially causing harm to your users, and you're going to get probably inundated or get calls from, I mean, depending on how they do it, of people where money's been transferred out of their accounts, they didn't authorize this, and you have uh, now a huge problem. Um, and then we get to the problem of password reuse. So I said that's not my problem. Is that true? So what do I care about as a person who, let's say, <coughs> is running a password-based system? What are those password-based systems that you use? Email. Email. Bank. Bank. Literally almost everything, right? And they're all websites that, at the end of the day, usually are trying to make money, right? So one way of thinking about it is saying, well, we don't want our users being harmed, right? Either by us accidentally, by rogue employees, 
or by people hacking into us and stealing this uh, database. But so let's say that a user has used their password on multiple sites. So uh, somebody give me odds. What are the odds that one website gets hacked and all their passwords are released? High. High? <laughs> Actually, don't know. I think website, relatively low. Say, say it again. If it's any one website, it's relatively. Running any, any one website, yeah, I'd say it's relatively low, but also over time, probably certain, almost. I don't know how to phrase that, but um, even if it's ten percent, now if you've shared your password, the same password on two different websites, now what's your chances of your password being leaked? Double, because now either site, both sites have a 10% chance of getting hacked. And either one means that an attacker can now log into both sites. Now what about three sites? Four sites, five sites, six sites. Uh, the hundreds of sites that you use daily, including your bank, your email, along with uh, your sock company and the company, because you do want to save your high scores on your video game, so you use that site. Um, now, any of those get compromised, and now an attacker has access to all of your other accounts. Is that a problem? Yeah. 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 I mean, I would think so. Does this do anything to combat that problem? No, not really. Um, that is actually more of a uh, recommendation for everyone here to not reuse passwords on their sites. Uh, we'll get into it more later, but my recommendation is use a password manager much. It has its own issues, but uh, I'm, I use LastPass. I like it a lot. It works on mobile. The new iPhone update is awesome because you, you can put your passwords right in from LastPass into the website. Uh, it's great. So, how can we solve this problem? What's the key thing that we need? So what, what, okay, let's think about it in terms of requirements. What don't we want to do? We don't want to store the password. We don't want to store the password. So why don't we use encryption, right? We have this great encryption stuff. Isn't the entire purpose of encryption to take something from plain text and turn it into something that people can't decipher? <coughs> so what if now I generate a super long, random 256-bit AES key called K, and then every password that comes in before I store it, I encrypt it with K. And so now what's going to be in C? Uh, a username and not a password, but what? Password encrypted with K. Yeah, so it'd be a, uh, we won't do the whole thing, but we'll do basically it'll be you name and encrypt pass with K. <coughs> now, if somebody steals C, what do they get? A list of usernames. Passwords. A list of usernames and encrypted passwords. Did I, we just solve all of our problems? No. no. Why not? Yeah. If you get the key, you get everyone's password. If you get the key, you get everyone's password. Why is that a problem? It's a super long, random, 256 bit key. also semi leaves you open to uh, if they know someone else if they know a password that they reused on your site from another site then you can they can use that to try and attack the key on your site as well uh, so modern symmetric crypto systems are immune to chosen plain text attacks so you should not be able to do that yeah do you have something like oh it's the same thing okay yeah if they've hacked your site already to get C, then it's likely that they might have also been able to hack it and get K. Yeah, because what, so how do you, so where is K going to be in this 
abstract system? On the website or in your server? Well, on this abstract system. So where is K? So we didn't we just put it no. here, but where else who else needs to know about K? L. Oh. L needs to know about K. What else? F. F maybe needs to know about actually F just needs to look up the user in the database right now. <coughs> S needs to know about K. What was it? S needs to know about S. K. Everything in S probably needs to know about K. So here you have some bit of information, a 256 bit, uh, bit key that 90% of your system needs to know about. So if somebody's able to hack, and the question is, where does that key live? You gonna put it in the database? Along with C? Yeah, it has to be separate, but, but still accessible by all of these components. So uh, this is a dangerous game to play because you think you're being super clever you're using modern encryption that is very good encryption. Um, <coughs> and so, and fundamentally, right, once they get this, if they have uh, everything that's been encrypted with K, they get the whole database and they get K, what do they then do? Just decrypt everything. Bang, 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 bang. Have all the plain text passwords. So, and there are companies you can look up. I don't want to accidentally shame a company, uh, but there's a company whose data was breached that was basically doing this. And um, it, it's one of those things, like, I guess, technically, it is slightly better <coughs> than doing nothing, assuming you're doing it properly of where you store your keys. But basically, every server that you're running needs to know the key. And so that, keeping that data confidential, confidential is very, very difficult. And as soon as that's leaked, then the whole game is over. Right? So you have this key that rather than being this secret key needs to actually be on every piece of your infrastructure. And now your attack service is, well, seal the database and seal this 256 bits from the machine. Which, depending, if they can get to your database, the odds are that they likely be able to do this somehow. All right, so scrap that. Yeah, question? Yeah, would it just be that like public private <coughs> encryption would just take too long to be able to do something like this? So public private key crypto? So what do you want to do with your scheme? I guess like when you create a username, you encrypt it with the public key mm -hmm. or something, and then it gets stored in the database with your public key, and then if you want to change or access it, mm. you can decrypt it with your own private key that the user has. The user, yeah, okay, so. That way each user has their own decryption. But I know the public private key takes a long time, like it's kind of intensive. Yes, so um, the short answer is for something like this, logging into a website, yes, this is usually overkill. There's a lot of other challenges to actually get that system working because if they have their secret key, the only thing they can send you is things signed or encrypted with their secret key. So you would have to generate some challenge to them where they would then take that encrypt it with their secret key, send it back to you, and then uh, you would need to verify that with their private key, that it was signed correctly, and that it was the right thing. And then you need to worry about time so that somebody else can't steal that communication and just log in as you. Um, it, and then the other thing is, this would mean that, so if you think about a web browser, you would either need a secret key on every single, the same secret key on every single device that you use, which then is difficult. How do you do that? Or you need to have multiple public keys. And how do you, you now have the bootstrap problem of how do you log in from a new machine that you've never seen before. So it's, it's done. And this is how a lot of like infrastructure that talks to each other. But for something like HTTP, which was never actually intended for something like this, uh, doing that is difficult. So what else? That was a good, good, yeah. Encrypt the password with the username and the username with the password. Encrypt, wait, say that again? Uh, the username with the password and the password with the username and then compare it like at the L. <coughs> okay, so then we do E, U name with pass, and then E pass.
mess with you name. Cool. That was cool. Okay, so the username is encrypted with the key of the password. The password is encrypted with the key of the username. So if somebody steals this database, what do they get? A bunch of ciphertext. Can they go backwards? Hopefully not. Hopefully not. So what do they do? Are they stuck? Have we foiled? It feels like there's an attack there. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't what know is it? what it is. <laughs> yeah, in the back. It'd be a dictionary attack with a commonly used password. And then you would do what? That have been leaked. <coughs> You'd try and decrypt it. So you could go. So just try for every password. What would your first password be? Password. Password. So you try that on every one of the usernames. As soon as that pops out a username, you now know the password for that username. And then you try probably password one or QWERTY or, I don't know, I'm not up to date on all the common password schemes. Yeah. Also, for a lot of sites, the username has a, has a form. So you could just take common names. Yeah, so then you have, in this scheme now, you could attack the username, right? So you could try <coughs> taking a username that you've guessed, decrypting the password. If you get something that looks like a password, you're correct. And then you can actually verify it on this one by using that password to decrypt this thing and then popping out the same username that you started with. Um, are usernames secret? No, 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 generally not. Generally not, right? So for a site like, so think about if you did this kind of a scheme, now the username becomes a secret piece of information that you need to hide. So you couldn't actually anywhere on your website have usernames because an adversary could just crawl for usernames, use them all, and try each one on every single hash, and then break basically all of your passwords and all of the usernames. But if it's emails, I just get email lists. You can get lists of emails, figure out who your users are. That's uh, slightly better, but yeah, this is, uh, um, I think the key thing is that you can't, the whole point of the username password approach is that the username should be available or knowable to everyone and only the password is secret. All right, so what else? Yeah. Hashes. Hashes. So why is a hash useful here? What about, what are the properties of a hash that makes it uh, amenable or amenable to this? Um, so there's, like, different passwords are going to generate drastically different hashes. So you have, right, so different passwords generate different hashes. You can't reverse engineer it. You should not, it's a one-way function, right? You should not be able to, assuming, let's, we'll assume we're using a cryptographically secure hash function. So take some hash function of the pass. So we'd store the username and a hash. Well, that's ugly. <coughs> so what does this get us then? So now let's go through a attack scenario. So just like before, we said C leaks. Now what? So they'll know all the usernames, which is fine. We'll assume those are public anyways. Can they take that hash and go backwards to the yeah. passwords? No. Nope. Yeah. Yes. Yes, in what sense? Can they take a hash and go backwards? Yes. Without any other information? Yeah. OK. <laughs> That's what I wanted to talk about first. Um, so just getting the hash without any outside information or any other knowledge, going backwards should be incredibly difficult. But that only is true in what case? that the password is random or large enough that we can't guess it. So now you want to go? No. No? <laughs> you were there. I was setting you up. It was a lot. No? OK. Um, so it's still vulnerable to a dictionary attack, because assuming the hash function is public, you can just try common passwords and then hash them and then see if the hashes are the same. Yeah, so actually, even before that, would you know which users have the same hashes? Yes. yes. Why? The hash is the same. So it's a one-to-one one, 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 that means. It's a one-to-one. Well, it's an 
10 to 1. Well, yeah. all right, the same password will hash to the same value. Let's say that. That'll be very precise what we need. Right? Which now means that every password, every password that is password, you will identify in the, the hash, right? And you can even just easily do statistics and say what users are using the same passwords. <coughs> and then you could go, if you needed to figure out those passwords, then you could try, you would just, you could take, you could uh, brute force it in terms of length or however you want to do it in terms of most likely password lists. You take that password, hash it, and see if any other hashes map to that. And now you know the password for all that users. Do you actually know for a fact that it's definitely their password? No. No, but what do you know? Hash, it'll still work. It hashes to the same value, so it doesn't matter. I mean, it is theoretically possible for two ASCII strings to hash to the same value. And so it's possible that you didn't find their password, but it doesn't matter because you're still into the system. Cool. <coughs> so now, so what were the problems with this approach? It sounds pretty clean, right? And actually, to go back, we'll actually go to do some history. Uh, remember when we talked about Unix? How does, uh, where does Unix store its uh, list of users? Password? ETC password, P-A-S-S-W-D. Were there any passwords in there when we looked at it? No. 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 Uh, but it used to be that, yes, they didn't store passwords in there, but they stored hashes of passwords in there. Um, and so your password had to be, here we'll only focus on passwords, not usernames. Uh, so here, your password was a string of eight characters or less, and this was dictated by the systems at the time. Uh, oh, so wait, okay, more, more, uh, more history first. Uh, okay, so you have a Unix system. We now have a password file where everyone can see the hashes of everybody's password. Why is that a problem? You just give them a C. You just give them what? You've given everyone on the system that can view that file C. Okay, what's the last word you said? C. 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 Oh, C. Yes, sorry. Why are we talking about this? Um, yeah, so you've given them C, so they can see all the hashes, which has all of the problems now. Can they change it? Can an average user change that file? No. No, it's only readable and exec uh, readable and writable. It's only writable by root. Uh, everyone can read that file though, because they need to be able to see the other users on the system and what their user IDs are, all that fun stuff. Uh, so then what's the problem with that? Why is that an issue? Yeah. The same uh, as statistical attacks are available to people that can view that, that password file. Or they can also see users that have the same passwords. And then yeah, or even as you, you could, I mean, you don't have to change it, but you could easily just view the password file and see what users are using the same password, possibly as you. Your password is password, you could see every other user that's using that. You can calculate the hashes, you could do all the attacks we just talked about. And so what's the key problem here? that they all hash to the same thing. That every single password hashes to the same value, right? Because we, without any other information, we can't go back through the hash from the hash, but because every hash <coughs> is determined, not, and we definitely don't want non-determinism in here. So what can we do? Somebody who doesn't already know. We could use like some other information about the user, like not not their username. Why can't we use their username? Because that's because it's public. So if we use their username, then what would happen? So two people have the same have the same password as password. They have the same username. Yeah. No, I mean, they can't have the same password and the same username. Otherwise, they're the same user according to our system. But, so, so let's say they're different <laughs> usernames, same password. So let's, we'll just combine them together and concatenate them and hash it. Will the hashes be the same? No. No. So we can do, we can change our scheme slightly. We'll use vertical bars to do concatenation. So concatenate the username and the password, <coughs> hash that. 
Yeah, anybody else can do that. So they could, so we've at least gotten rid of the same password hash to the same thing. Um, so what we can, what somebody would need to do is let's say they wanted to break my user's password. So I guess, question. Uh, before, what did somebody have to do to find out every user in the system who had the password and password? Just see what ha hash password and then see all the hashes that it's in. Yeah, and see who has that, right? And you can create a hash table out of all the hashes, so it's basically an 01 operation. It's trivial to find that out. Now in this scheme, can I do the same thing? No. Yes. Not as easily. Wait, the usernames are public, right? <coughs> usernames are public. So then we can just concatenate password with it and then hash it. But how many user accounts are I able to figure out if they have the same password as password? So before, how many how many hashing operations did I have to do to figure out I don't know, one. one? And I can test the entire database with that one hash. Now I have to do individual hashes against each of the individual usernames, which can increase the attacker's workload. Uh, we will not use the, well, uh, rather than using the username, which can vary in length, it can vary in terms of randomness. Um, so we're going to create a salt and add that to the, to the password before we hash it. But the salt specifically will be public. And so this was, um, so anyways, we will uh, come back to this after the midterms, you all forget, but you all want to study this. How are we doing? Is it considered best practice to salt, to like re-salt if they change their password?